So we're going to finish the improper integral. So we split it on the vertical asymptote, and now we have basically two separate integrals to do. <coughs> So from here, what we need are two limits. So I circled the end, uh, end values that need to get turned into limits. So 0 is bad. So I'm going to take a limit integral negative 1 to a. a approaches, oops, we did, oop, we got alpha, not a. I'm just looking at that blue. Uh, drawing right there. Alpha x to the negative 2 dx plus lim, we use beta here. So I have to be a little bit more careful with my uh, values my limits are approaching. What do I need to add to this, both of these limits? Uh, directions. From the negative and positive side. Yeah, so you need to be one-sided limits, both of them. And you want to make sure you get the side right for each one. So the one that goes from negative 1 to 0, so that's the first. It also makes sense the order you write them. You want to write your basically the smaller part of your interval, and then the medium and the big part. So keep them ordered. That will help out a lot. So alpha is approach 0 on the negative side. And beta is going to approach 0 on the positive side. So go ahead, take these antiderivatives. And the antiderivatives are easy to take. And then uh, evaluate your limit. And you're definitely going to have an infinity hanging around. You have to be careful.
So I took my, I applied the sum rule for the limits and then reorder my terms. So my limit parts that are constant are basically separated from the limit parts that are changing. And minus one plus one cancels out. So that's good. <clears throat> now these two limits right here, what is the alpha limit? Small. So alpha gets really small. So alpha approaches zero from the negative side. That means alpha is less than zero. So that means it's negative one over a tiny negative number, which is a really big positive number. So you have to know which way, you know, if alpha is positive or negative, so you can say positive or negative infinity. So alpha is negative, so it's negative over um, a small negative value, so this is positive infinity. What about our second limit? That one should be a little more obvious because every, everything's positive. That one should be positive infinity also. Something went wrong. One of these should be negative infinity. Where do we go wrong? for our, like this term here. So that, that would be the constant term. I think there's three negative signs in there. Actually, never mind. No, this is okay. I know why. Yeah, it's 1 over x squared. The original graph is going to look like this. So it's positive on both sides. All right, so I was thinking it was a 1 over x or 1 over x cubed, which would have been 1 of negative and 1 positive. All right, so this makes sense then. All right, so we got infinity plus infinity is infinity. Now I want to warn you, what's infinity minus infinity? Do you remember L'Hopital's rule? What is infinity minus infinity? What did we have to do? But well, L'Hopital's rule doesn't, it doesn't apply at all to infinity minus infinity. It also doesn't apply to things like uh, zero to the zero power. There's some weird forms. So what did you have to do in L'Hopital's section when you didn't have a L'Hopital's form? Algebra. Algebra. So sometimes it was apply a natural log. Sometimes it was take two things that are subtracted, common denominator, add them together, things like that. Uh, you want to be careful. These limits are not, they're not x approaches, x approaches. They're not the same letter, not the same variable. So you can't just um, bring the limit outside. So on these, uh, if you get infinity plus infinity, it's definitely infinity. But if you get any single piece is infinity, the whole thing uh, is not integrable. So any single piece being infinitely big means your entire integral is what we call not integrable or not able to be integrated. So if any piece has infinite area, Best way to say this is probably so the integral value will either be plus infinity, minus infinity, or um, if you get a plus and a minus infinity, you would say it has no uh, no value or it's not integrable. Well, 
That's a really bad English sentence. The integral is not integrable. The function is not integrable. On the um, interval. Now, if I change intervals, that one over x squared function is definitely integrable. So, if I changed intervals, I'd be able to do that. So, what I don't want you to do is see plus infinity, minus infinity, cancel them out. So, if you see a single infinity, you can right away say this is not integrable. Uh, probably the easiest example, the 1 over x function. So we had gx, 1 over x, easy to graph. If you go from minus a to a, the areas will cancel out. But when you integrate it, you don't say the integral is 0, even though looking they would cancel out. If you did it, you get a natural log, and that would be infinity when you took that limit. So not an integral despite the areas canceling. So that's about all we need for 8.7. So if you integrate across vertical asymptote, you have to partition at the vertical asymptote. And if you're going to go to infinity on either end or both ends, you also have to uh, take a limit there. And the other rules, you can't have two limits in a single integral. So I think, did I do any examples like that? I talked about it, I didn't do an example. So all we're going to do on this example is, is break it apart into separate pieces, not actually integrate the whole thing. So just want to split this up. So before you even think about vertical asymptotes, what are two v values that we have to treat? So both of the infinities have to be treated with limits. How many vertical asymptotes do we have to worry about? Two. We got two vertical asymptotes and plus and minus infinity. So let's draw our number line out. Minus infinity, plus infinity. We have 0 and 2 are the asymptotes. So we could split into these three pieces right here. Let's go ahead and start there. Minus infinity to 0. And let's get lazy. I'm just going to write f instead of the whole function dx. 0 to 2, 2 to infinity. So now I'm going to write out what not to do. So in negative infinity, I have to have a limit for that value. And we have vertical asymptote at 0. So I need another limit at 0. So this is what not to do. Two limits on a single integral. Double limits are really, really tough. They're tough for me. So they're no joke. The limit, uh, if you actually do this, the limit, taking limits is not commutative. So you can't just take the outside limit first. You take the inside limit first. Uh, so if you ever stack two limits up, you're doing the wrong thing. So don't go that way. How do we treat, so that's the improper way to treat this improper integral. How do we properly treat that? Split it up again. So now we have to make a choice. 
there are bad x values to choose. What's a decent x value? One and negative one. Well, so remember, our x value needs to, in this one, fall inside the first integral, or first interval. So negative one, I think, will probably be the easiest. You can choose any number between negative infinity and zero. But I think negative one is a good choice. What you definitely don't want to choose is positive one. If you choose positive one, you're crossing your vertical asymptote. You're going back across it the other way. So you do not want to choose an x value that's not between. So that's super important on the improper integrals. So I'm going to write on our number line, these are the choices we're making. We're choosing to split at negative 1. And what's 0 and 2 are also uh, values I have to be careful at. So I need to split also at positive 1. And I also need to split between 2 and infinity. So we'll go and split at 3 or 16. How about 13? That's a good number. So all the numbers written in black are ones that are going to get limits. So if I have an integral here, I'm going to have two limit endpoints, basically. If I go all the way from negative infinity to 0, I'm going to have a double limit, which is what I wrote right here. So this would be a really bad way to write your first integral. And if you start, the, your spidey sense will kick in if you see limit, limit. Then you should be like, oh no. This is really bad. I don't know how to do this. All right, so we're splitting each integral again into two pieces. So we're going negative infinity to negative 1. And if you want, at the end, I'll circle all the ones that we're going to turn into limits. So negative infinity to negative 1 plus negative 1 to 0 plus, so that was just the first. Now the second integral went 0 to 1 plus 1 to 2 plus 2 to 3 plus 3 to infinity. Are we using 13, not 3? Oh, 13, yeah. So I'm going to circle in green all the endpoints that are going to turn into a limits. Only half of these are, but you need to be careful. Certainly, the infinities are going to limits, for sure. Now, I need to be careful. The zeros and the twos are the other values that are going to turn into limits, not the negative 1, positive 1, or the 13. So the zeros and the twos. And if you notice, <coughs> they should form this pattern like this right here, because basically they these two correspond. That's your vertical asymptote where we broke it up right there. So they're going to occur in these patterns. And every vertical asymptote you have will have this pattern right here. Now the next step is write down eight limits. Sorry, six limits. And you have to be careful on the zeros. You have to approach on the correct side. So that's, again, why we wrote this out. So when I approach 0, one time I'll be approaching on the negative side, and the other time I'll be approaching on the positive side. And you have to match those up correctly. So we'd use six limits. Um, four of which are one-sided. So I'm not going to write out all limits that come out of this. This problem is probably too many pieces to put. It's a decent homework problem, but it's too many pieces to put on a quiz or a midterm. But it is important that you know, at least know how to split it apart. And this is how you do it. And this is another good time where it's convenient to have a second color pen or pencil. So you can write down, here's my vertical asymptote numbers, and here's the numbers I arbitrarily pick. So you know which ones need limits, which ones don't. So that's pretty much everything you need to know about improper integrals. And now we're going to jump into chapter 10.
So let's write out some common limits that we've seen before. I'm going to write them with, uh, instead of the x variable, the variable we'll use is n. But it's the same as what we saw before. Ln n looks a little weird when you write it out. So sometimes you want to put the parentheses in. So it's the natural log of n over n. Anybody remember this limit from L'Hopital's rule? So it's definitely infinity over infinity if you just plug it in. So L'Hopital's rule, derivative of natural logs 1 over n, derivative of n is 1. So this is the same as limit 1 over n, which is 0. Next limit, x to the 1 over n. Now this limit's a little weird because there's an x and an n. So there's two variables. x is not changing. So the, the limit is changing the value of n. So if you think about this, when x is positive, so when n is really big, you're thinking of a hundredth root or a millionth root. Even if x is really big, eventually, uh, if you take enough roots, It'll get very close to 1, even if your number's huge. What happens if x is 0? What would we get? Zero. 0. What about negative? What if it's negative 1? What problem will we run into if we let x be negative? What happens for every even value of n? Yeah, so square root, cube root, six root, eighth root, all the even roots would be imaginary. So it wouldn't make sense if x was negative, unless you wanted a complex limit, which I don't think you want in this course. So if we keep it real, we want to make sure x is greater than 0. So we computed that limit as well. Now this limit is n to the 1 over n power. And this one is also going to be 1. I think we did something like this. Use L'Hopital's rule. This is where you use a natural log function. So you can turn that power into a product. So this is definitely not true for all x values. For example, 1, when x equals 1, that's definitely not true. What type of x values would have their limit raised to the nth power get smaller? Well, certainly 0. That works. Between 0 and 1? Yeah, what if x is little? Between 0 and 1. Think about a half. What happens if you keep raising a half to more and more powers? It gets cut in half every time. So eventually, you'll get very close to 0. So if x is small, this will be 0. How small? 1 is the magic number. So if you're 1, uh, raising it to n power is going to keep you at 1. But if you're less than 1, you get smaller and smaller and smaller. And same thing is true for negative values. Like negative one half. So as long as absolute value of x is less than one, if it's a small value, when you raise it to higher powers, it gets smaller. Well, 
what type of n value, uh, x values will give you infinity from this limit? Greater than one. Greater than one. So I'll write it. One plus well, equal to x. So if x equals one, you're going to be one the whole time. And if x is bigger than one, you raise to higher power, so you keep getting a bigger value. And negative values are weird. Negative uh, values go positive, negative, positive, negative. So they'd alternate signs. So they would not uh, settle down to infinity. They'd keep going negative huge number, positive huge number, negative huge number, positive huge number. <coughs> so when x is less than 1, uh, the limit does not exist. And the last one so this exclamation point is a factorial right here. And I will define that right now. So the factorial is n times n minus 1 times n minus 2, etc., etc., times 2 times 1. So that is n factorial. That is n factorial, and at least in this class, it's only defined for positive uh, integers. And 0, 1, 2, up to arbitrarily large values. That's n factorial. Let's write a few factorials down. So 1 factorial is 1, 2 factorial is 2 times 1, which is 2, so write down 3, 4, and 5 factorial. And if you're writing down in order, they're not too bad. Well, if I asked you for 13 factorial, it'd be good bad at some point. But you can go to 5, definitely. Actually, go to 6. It's good to know a little more. When you're dealing with factorials, it's good to be able to do algebra on them as well. So 3 factorial, you could write it as 3 times 2 times 1. You can also write it as 3 times 2 factorial. So I'm just multiplying the above number by 3, and we get 6. 4 factorial, we'll play the same game. So 4 factorial is 4 times 3 factorial. And we got 3 factorial is 6. And same thing with 5 factorial, so it's 24 times 5, which is 120. And last up, 6 times 5 factorial is 720. So there are some factorials. One other thing I want you to notice is n factorial is n times n minus 1 factorial. So you can factor factorials. And of course, you don't have to just factor this way. You can factor out two numbers and write it as n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 factorial. Sometimes you need to uh, factor out two. Sometimes you need to bring out three or four so you can cancel stuff. So that is factorials. There's one extra factorial that doesn't follow the pattern. 
0 factorial is defined to be 1. And there's a few reasons for that, mainly because computations work out really well when 0 factorial is 1. Now, if you're wondering what about all the other numbers, don't they get some factorial? The answer is yes, they do, and it's called the gamma function. And you can go read about it if you want to. What about negative numbers? Yep. Um, it is, I, I want to say it's complex valued a lot of the time, and I think it still has some vertical asymptotes at the negative integers, I believe. So you'll learn about that in uh, differential equations if you take that next spring. So we'll do our first limit. So this is the 2 nth root of 3n. So whenever doing calculus, usually that square root notation or the root notation is not terribly useful. So use the reciprocal notation instead. Now unfortunately, I can't use any of the common limits from above directly. So let's just naively plug in infinity and see what we get. So we get three infinities raised to the zero power. So what is that? Is that an indeterminate form, or can we just say what this is? Indeterminate form. Indeterminate form. There's about eight of them. You just need to know what they look like. So this is infinity to the zero power. So yeah, we can't use L'Hopital's rule yet. We know it's coming up, but we can't use it yet. We have to turn it to a uh, fraction. That's 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity. So how do we turn it into a fraction? So we take the natural log. So just remember, you probably were aware of this in L'Hopital's rule. If you take the natural log, at the very end, you have to untake the natural log. So if I find the limit of the natural log, at the end, I found the limit of the natural log, and I have to ln inverse my uh, result. So I'm going to take natural log. So if I call this value up here, if I call it y, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply natural log to both sides, basically. So I get ln y equals ln lim n approaches infinity. I'll use that middle version, 3n, 1 over 2n. So remember, you got to treat both sides fairly. That's why I took, I, I started with an equation and then took the natural log of both sides. Um, at the very last step, we're going to unnatural log both sides, or ln inverse both sides. So I'm only going to change the right side. Why am I allowed to push my natural log function through my limit? Why is that OK to do? And which function is continuous? The natural log function. So the function that is continuous, I can push through a limit. You cannot push a function through a derivative. That has a whole bunch of rules. Uh, you're basically shortcutting the chain rule if you push the function through a uh, push a derivative through a function. So all we're going to do is rewrite. And the algebra. So natural log is going to turn the coefficient into a, or turn the exponent to a coefficient. So it's going to look like this. It's going to turn right into a fraction. So that coefficient is 1 over 2n, or just divided by 2n. All right, so finish this off with L'Hopital's rule. So write down whether it's infinity over infinity or 0 over 0, and then LH, and find, use L'Hopital's rule.
value, we're trying to solve for y. So take that back and figure out what y is. So I want to warn you about the way you write things. The way I wrote this was a little bit confusing, and it was really only because the way this is confusing because of the place where I wrote it. It makes a lot more sense if I just moved it to the left a half inch. So why is that? You just follow these equal signs right down. And the L and Y is on the left the entire time. I just change around the right side. And then when I finally change the left side, and I should align this as well. When I finally did change the left side, so I took LN inverse, that's when I write natural log Y, and then when it changed to Y right there. So you see, oh, it was LN Y. You can keep writing LN Y. LNY, LNY, but eventually it gets annoying. So it's not changing, don't write it down. But when you do that, just make sure that you align your equal sign. Otherwise, it's a little bit more, it looks like you're creating new equations if things aren't aligned. So those three natural log y's, you don't need to write them down because nothing's changing there. So let's talk about recursive. Oh, we started right in the middle of the section. Let's go back to the beginning. All right. So those are common limits we've seen before, at least. So it wasn't anything crazy. We will use factorial, and we're going to figure out if stuff converges or diverges. I don't think I've really used those words before, have I? No. All right. We did take the limit, but when we write down definition of convergence, we'll come back and answer, did it conform to that definition, or did it not? So without knowing what they actually mean, do you think uh, y equaling 1 means it converges or diverges? Converges. All right, starting at the beginning, what is the sequence? An easy definition, an ordered list of numbers. So you could technically just say a list of numbers, but the order is important. So if you swap around the order, you're talking about a different sequence. You can swap the order, but you're talking about a new sequence at that point. 
So that's a sequence, uh, an infinite sequence. So that means how many uh, numbers are in the list. So there's infinitely many. And of course, a finite sequence finitely many numbers. So what should have been our first example problem, write out first four terms of So there's a few ways to write out sequences. I'm generally going to write them with uh, these curly braces. And then we'll write a starting n value and a stopping n value. So all I want are the first four terms of this sequence. So this is a lot like summation notation, where you have your initial value, and uh, you just increment by one each time. So general, our general notation, I'll write that over here on the right side. So you just go A1, A2, A3. That's probably enough to see the pattern. So we just write dot, dot, dot. This one goes forever, so there's no end. And that would be infinite and finite. Very similar, except you put some value up there. I'll use capital N as the big N. I like to use capital N because in my head, just means big N. So it's the biggest N value you're going to. <coughs> Good. A1, A2, A3, dot, dot, dot. The pattern's obvious, but the pattern doesn't go forever. And A big N is the last term. So all I want for this is the first four terms. So write down the first four terms. So you're going to have a0, a1, a2, oop, not a0. This one starts at 1. So I don't care about the fifth and the later terms. So what effect did negative 1 to the n power have? On this. Yep, so it changes the sign. We call that alternating sign. So one way you can see it as negative 1 to the n power, uh, or negative 1 to the n plus 1 power. Either way, you just multiply by another negative 1 each time. Another sneaky way, so 1, oops, negative 1 to the n alternate signs. There's another way to alternate signs. Well, there's, if you try hard enough, there's infinite number of ways to alternate signs. But another relatively common one is cosine pi n. What is cosine of 0? There's 1. What is cosine of pi? Zero. Negative 1. That would be a half, a half lap. And what if you go full lap? You're back to positive 1. Positive 1, negative 1. Positive 1, negative 1. So cos pi n is another way to alternate signs. You're generally going to see that one probably 90% of the time. And then if somebody just 
trying to be clever, you might see cos pi n occasionally as well. You could do other things, like for example, cos if you want to get very clever, pi over 2n doesn't quite alternate signs. It goes positive 1, 0, negative 1, 0. So there are, you can do other weird things like this. Uh, but there'll be other ways, there'll be better ways to write it than that if you actually want that pattern, you know, 1, 0, negative 1, 0. Could you make it so that you alternate signs every three terms? You can, you'd have to work a little harder to do that one. Okay. Uh, We'd have to like kind of normalize them or something because you wouldn't necessarily have one every time. Um, but that's where things get a little more complicated to to do that. I'd probably, if you knew that pattern was happening, I would probably combine your two positive terms into one. They'd try to do something like that. So then it would go two positive terms, positive term, negative term, positive term, negative term. If you looked at it a little differently.